Chapter One of Marie Antoinette and the Downfall of Royalty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Libby Gone. Marie Antoinette and the Downfall of Royalty by Humbert de Saint Amand. Translated by Elizabeth G. Martin. Chapter One Paris at the Beginning of 1792. Paris in 1792 is no longer what it was in 1789. In 1789 the old French society was still brilliant. The past endured beside the present. Neither names nor escutcheons, neither liveries nor palaces at court had been suppressed. The aristocracy and the revolution lived face to face. In 1792 the scene had changed. The Paris of the nobility was no longer in Paris, but at Coblenz. The Faubourg Saint-Germain is like a desert. Since June 1790, armorial bearings have been taken down. The blazons of ancient houses have been broken and thrown into the gutters. No more display, no more liveries, no more carriages with coats of arms on their panels. Titles and manorial names are done away with. The Duc de Brisac is called Monsieur Cossé. The Duc de Caramon, Monsieur Riquet. The Duc d'Aguillon, Monsieur Vignerot. The Almanac Royal of 1792 mentions not a single court appointment. In 1789 it was still an exceptional thing for the nobility to emigrate. In 1792 this is the rule. Those among the nobles who have had the courage to remain at Paris in the midst of the furnace so as to make a rampart for the king of their bodies seemed half ashamed of their generous conduct. The illusions of worldliness have been dispelled. Nearly every salon was open in 1789. In 1792 they are nearly all closed, those of the magistrates and the great capitalists, as well as those of the aristocracy. Etiquette is still observed at the Tuileries, but there is no question of fête, no balls, no concerts, none of the elegance and animation which once made the court a rendezvous of pleasures. In 1789, illusions, dreams, a naive expectation of the age of gold were to be found everywhere. In 1792, Ecologues and pastoral poetry are beginning to go out of fashion. The diapason of hatred is pitched higher. Already there is powder and a smell of blood in the air. A general instinct forebodes that France and Europe are on the verge of a terrible duel. On both sides, passions have touched their culminating point. Distrust and uneasiness are universal. Every day, the despotism of the clubs becomes more threatening. The Jacobins do not reign yet, but they govern. Deputies, who if left their own impulses would vote on the conservative side, pronounce for the revolution solely through fear of the demagogues. In 1789, the religious sentiment still retained power among the masses. In 1792, irreligion and atheism have wrought their havoc. In 1789, the most ardent revolutionists, Marat, Danton, Robespierre, were all royalists. At the beginning of 1792, the Republic begins to show its face beneath the monarchical mask. The Tuileries, menaced by the neighboring lanes of the Carousel and the Palais Royal, resembles a besieged fortress. The Revolution daily augments its trenches and parallels around the sanctuary of the monarchy. Its barracks are the faubourgs, its soldiers, red bonneted pikemen. Louis the Sixteenth in his palace is like a general in chief of a stronghold who should have voluntarily dampened his powder spiked his cannon and torn his flags he no longer inspires his troops with confidence a capitulation seems imminent the unfortunate monarch still hopes vaguely for assistance from abroad for the arrival of some liberating army vain hope he is blockaded in his castle and the moment is at hand when he will be compelled to play the buffoon in a red bonnet glance at the palace and see how closely it is hemmed in by the earthworks of the revolution the abode of luxury and display intended for fetes rather than for war philbert de lorme's chef d'oeuvre had in its architecture none of those means of defence by which the military and feudal sovereignties of old times fortified their dwellings on the side of the courtyards a multitude of little streets contain a hostile population ready to swell every riot near the pavilion of marsan is the palais royal the headquarters of insurrection with its cafes its gambling dens its houses of ill fame its wooden galleries which are known as the camp of the tartars it is the duke of orleans who has democratized the palais royal in spite of the sarcasms of the aristocracy and the lawsuits of neighboring proprietors 
he has destroyed the fine gardens bounded by the rue de richelieu the rue des petits champs and the rue des bons enfants in the place it occupied he has caused the rue de valois the rue de beaujolais and the rue de montpensier to be opened all of them inhabited by a revolutionary population the remaining space he has surrounded on three sides with constructions pierced by galleries where he has built the shops that form the finest bazaar in europe the fourth side of these new constructions was originally intended to form part of the prince's palace and to be composed of an open colonnade supporting suites of apartments but this side has not been erected in place of it the duke of orleans has run up some temporary wooden sheds containing three rows of shops separated by two large passageways the ground of which has not even been made level the privileges pertaining to the orleans family prevent the police from entering the enclosure of the palais royal hence it becomes the rendezvous of all conspirators the taking of the bastille was plotted there and there the twentieth of june and the tenth of august will yet be organized a little further off is the national assembly its sessions are held in the riding school built when the little louis the fifteenth was to be taught horsemanship it adjoins the terrace of the foyon one of its courtyards which looks towards the front of the edifice is at the upper end of the rue de dauphin the other extremity occupies the site where the rue castiglione will be opened later on there close beside the tuileries sits the national assembly the rival and victorious power that will overcome the monarchy the assembly terrorizes the tuileries the jacobin club terrorizes the assembly close beside the hall of the menage on the site to be occupied afterwards by the market of st honore the revolutionary club holds its tumultuous sessions in the former convent founded in sixteen eleven by the jacobin or dominican friars the club meets three times a week at seven in the evening the hall is a long rectangle with a vaulted roof four rows of stalls occupy the longer sides while the two ends serve as public galleries nearly in the middle of the hall the speaker's platform and the president's writing table stand opposite each other hither come all ambitious revolutionaries who desire to talk to agitate to make themselves conspicuous here robespierre lords it not being a deputy in consequence of the law forbidding members of the constituent assembly to belong to the legislative body those who love disorder come here to seek emotions some find lucrative employment applause being paid for and the different parties having each its clack in the galleries since april seventeen ninety one the jacobin club has affiliations in two thousand french towns and villages at its orders and in its pay is an army of agents whose business it is to make stump speeches to sing in the streets to make propositions in cafes to applaud or to hiss in the galleries of the national assembly these hirelings usually receive about five francs a day but as the number of chevaliers of the revolutionary lustrum increases the pay diminishes until it is finally reduced to forty sous deserters and soldiers dismissed from their regiments for misconduct are admitted by preference for some days past the club of moderate revolutionists friends of lafayette who might have closed the old clubs after the sanguinary repression of the riot in the champ de mars and who contented themselves with opening a new one have been meeting in the convent of the foyon rue st honore but this new club has not been a great success moderation is not the order of the day the jacobins have regained their empire and on december twenty sixth seventeen ninety one seals are placed on the door of the club of the foyon at the other extremity of paris there is a club still more inflammatory than that of the jacobins that of the cordeliers the jacobins said barbaroux have no common aim although they act in concert the cordeliers are bent on blood gold and offices speaking as a rule the cordeliers belong to the jacobin club while hardly a single jacobin is a cordelier the cordeliers are the advance guard of the revolution they are as camille desmoulins has said jacobins of the jacobins the chiefs are danton marat herbert chaumet they take their names from the religious democrats the minorite friars of st francis who wear a girdle rope over their coarse gray habit they meet in the place of the school of medicine in a monastery whose church was built in the reign of st louis in twelve fifty nine with a fine paid as indemnity for a murder in fifteen ninety it became the resort of the most famous leaguers chateaubriand says there are places which seem to be a laboratory of seditions how well this expression of the author of the memoir d'outre-tombe 
describes the club-room of the cordeliers the pictures the sculpted or painted images the veils and curtains of the convent have been torn down the basilica displays nothing but its bare bones to the eye of the spectator at the apse where the wind and rain enter through the unglazed rose windows joiners work benches serve as a desk for the president and as places on which to deposit the red caps do you see the fallen beams the wooden benches the dismantled stalls the relics of saints pushed or rolled against the walls to serve as benches for dirty dusty drunken sweaty spectators in torn jackets pikes on their shoulders or with their bare arms crossed do you hear the orators who call each other beggars pickpockets robbers assassins to the discordant noise of hisses and those proper to their different groups of devils they find the material of their metaphors in murder they borrow them from the filthiest of stewers and dung heaps and from places set apart for the prostitution of men and women gestures render their figures of speech more comprehensible and with the cynicism of dogs they call everything by its own name in an imperious and obscene parade of oaths and curses to destroy and to produce death and generation nothing else can be disentangled from the savage jargon which deafens one's ear and what is this that interrupts the speakers the little black owls of the cloister without monks and the steeple without bells making themselves merry in the broken windows in expectation of their prey at first they are called to order by the tinkling of an ineffectual bell but as their cries do not cease they are shot at to make them keep silence they fall palpitating bleeding and ominous into the midst of the pandemonium so then clubs take the place of convents since the constituent assembly had decreed the abolition of monastic vows by its vote of february thirteenth seventeen ninety many persons rudely detached from their usual way of life and its duties had abandoned their vocation the nun became a working woman the shaved capuchin read his journal in suburban taverns and grinning crowds visited the profaned and open convents as in grenada travellers passed through the abandoned halls of the alhambra or as they paused at tivoli under the columns of the sibyl's temple the jacobin club and the club of the cordeliers will destroy the monarchy in the memoirs of lafayette it is remarked it is hard to understand how the jacobin minority and a handful of pretended marseillaise made themselves masters of paris when nearly all the forty thousand citizens composing the national guard desired the constitution but the clubs had succeeded in scattering the true patriots and in creating a dread of vigorous measures experience had not yet taught what this feebleness and disorganization must needs cost the dark side of the picture is plainly far more evident than it was in seventeen eighty nine but how vivid it is still those who hunger after sensations are in their element when has there been more noise more tumult more movement more unexpected or more varied scenes listen once more to chateaubriand who on his return from america passed through paris at this epoch when i read the histoire des troubles publics chez divers peuples before the revolution i could not conceive how it was possible to live in those times i was surprised that montaigne wrote so cheerfully in a castle which he could not walk around without risk of being abducted by bands of leaguers or protestants the revolution has enabled me to comprehend this possibility of existence with us men critical moments produce an increase of life in a society which is dissolving and forming itself anew the strife between the two tendencies the collision of the past and the future the medley of ancient and modern manners form a transitory combination which does not admit a moment of ennui passions and characters freed from restraint display themselves with an energy they do not possess in well-regulated cities the infraction of laws the emancipation from duties usages and the rules of decorum even perils themselves increase the interest of this disorder yes people complain grow angry suffer but they are not bored how many incidents episodes emotions there are in this strange tragicomedy everywhere there is something to be seen in the assembly the clubs the public places the promenades streets cafes and theatres brawls and discussions are heard on every side if by chance a salon is still open disputes go on there as they would at a club what quarrels take place in the cafes men stood on chairs and tables to spout and what dissensions in the theatres the actors meddle with politics as well as the spectators naudet and a left side led by the republican talma 
Neither actor goes out except well armed. There are pistols underneath their togas. The kings of tragedy, threatened by their political adversaries, have real poniards wherewith to defend themselves. Les Horaces, Brutus, La Mort de César, Barnevel, Guillaume Tell, Charles Neuf, are plays containing in each tirade allusions which inflame the boxes and the pits. The theatre is a tilting ground. If the royalists are there in force, they cause the orchestra to play their favourite airs, Charmant Gabriel, Vive Henri Quatre, O Richard, O Mon Roi. The revolutionists protest and sing their own chosen melody, Ça ira. Sometimes they come to blows, swords are drawn, and the play over, elegant women are dragged through the gutters. There is a general outbreak of insults and violence. The journals play the chief part in this universal madness. Sometimes the press is eloquent, but it is oftener ribald or atrocious. To borrow an expression from Montaigne, it lowers itself even to the worthless esteem of extreme inferiority. The beautiful French tongue, once so correct and pure, is no longer recognizable. Vulgar words fall thick as hail. The language of the academy has exceeded the jargon of the markets. What a swarm, what a swirl, how noisy, how restless, is this revolutionary Paris. What excited crowds fill the clubs, the assembly, the palais royal, the gambling houses, and the tumultuous faubourg. Riotous gatherings, popular deputations, detachments of cavalry, companies of foot soldiers, gentlemen in French coats, powdered hair, swords at their sides, hats under their arms, silk stockings and low shoes, democrats, close-cropped and unpowdered with English frock-coats and American cravats, ragged sans-culottes in red caps, weave in and out in ceaseless motion. Do you know what was the chief distraction of this crowd in April 1792? The debut of that new and fashionable machine, the guillotine. It was used for the first time on the 25th for a criminal guilty of rape. Sensitive people congratulated each other on the mitigated torment which they were pleased to consider a humanitarian improvement. The excellent philanthropist, Dr. Guillotin, was lauded to the skies. His machine was named the Guillotine in his honor, just as the stagecoaches established by Turgot had been called Turgotines. What enthusiasm, what infatuation for this Guillotine, already so famous and destined to be so much more so! The editors of the Moniteur declare in a lyric outburst that is worthy of the approaching century. The truth is that it accelerates and makes less difficult the executioner's task. In the end, the crowd would become disgusted with massacres. The delays of the gibbet would weary their patience. The sans-culottes, who doubtless have a presentiment of all that is going to happen, at the Ambigu Theatre, a ballet pantomime called Les Quatre Fils Aimon is given, and all Paris runs to see the heads of all four fall at once, in the midst of loud applause under the blade of the good doctor's machine. People amuse themselves with their future instrument of torture as if it were a toy. In a Girondin salon they play at guillotine with the movable screen that is lifted and let fall again. At elegant dinners a little guillotine is brought in with the dessert and takes the place of a sweet dish. A pretty woman places a doll representing some political adversary under the knife, and it is decapitated in the neatest possible style and out of it runs something red that smells good, a liqueur perfumed with ambergis, into which every lady hastens to dip her lace handkerchief. French gaiety would make a vaudeville out of the day of judgment. Poor society, which passes so quick from gay to grave, from lively to severe, and which, like the Figaro of Beaumarchais, laughs at everything so that it may not weep. End of chapter 1